Hello and welcome to another video. In this one, we're going to be talking about another scripting that I did for Pokemon games, uh, particular to catch shiny Pokemon in Sword and Shield via Dynamax Adventures. Uh, I'm going to walk you through a little bit of background there as well as the uh, microcontroller stuff. Um, I'm not going to rehash all of the microcontroller stuff, so uh, check out the playlist in the description where I go over in more detail. Uh, but the TLDR of it is I basically have a microcontroller that's similar to what you would do in a custom keyboard. Uh, it pretends to be a wired switch controller and plugs into the switch by a USB. It then connects to a USB UART device uh, so that I can speak to it via serial from my computer. And then I feed the video output of the switch through a capture card in my computer such that my code can read the screen and react to it and press buttons and do whatever it needs to do. Uh, implement essentially a, a custom made AI to play the game. Uh, now, today we're going to be talking about Dynamax Adventures and uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail. We'll get that when we sort of walk through the actual execution. Uh, but Dynamax Adventures is basically a I wouldn't say maze because it's more of just like a branching pattern. Uh, there will be three Dynamaxes and then finally a legendary Dynamax at the end. Uh, you're given a set of rental Pokemon and there are four people and you basically beat up the Pokemon and uh, you can catch them. And they have a pretty high rate of being shiny. Uh, with a shiny charm, it's one in 100. Otherwise, it's one in 300. Uh, now, that those odds are pretty good, but they're not actually better than just encountering in the wild from a time perspective, uh, just because it takes like 10 to 15 minutes to go through a single adventure. Um, but some of these Pokemon only appear here, and that's why I wanted to catch some shiny. Um, but yeah, yeah, and you can see here, shiny Pokemon from there. Uh, so what I decided to do was hook up a script where I would... Uh, tell it which Pokemon I'm looking to get shiny, uh, as well as their types. You'll notice here in the pathways uh, that the overword, overworld tells you what the types are. It also shows you silhouettes, but there is no way I was going to get uh, all, all um, 226 silhouettes and know which Pokemon are which. So I decided to route just based on types. Um, and I learned a couple of really cool things. I'm going to show you both of those uh, right now, actually. Yeah, sure. Uh, so the first thing is I wanted to figure out how to, oops, how to intelligently route these. Uh, for instance, in this example here, you know, uh, I know that I want to get grass, poison, ground, rock, electric, and psychic. I don't care about any of the other types. And so I need to be able to identify where this arrow is pointing and how many different options there are in order to choose one. And in order to do this, I learned a, a few things. Um, and I have a little example here. So here's an example of what I wanted the output to look like. Basically, uh, the green square identifies where the arrow is pointing and the blue rectangles identify uh, the text for each of the types. So steel, water, psychic, and you can't see ice because it's uh, on your, oops, over here, yeah, there we go, and ice. Uh, and so there's little blue rectangles, it's kind of hard to see here. Uh, but that was the goal of this. And in order to do this, um, I did a few things. The first thing that I did was thresholding. And this isn't new. I've done this in some of my other scripts. Basically, you pick a color or a hue or a, a you know hue saturation value and eliminate every, every other pixel. Uh, so what I did here is I looked for things with a like high saturation. I don't know, high something, uh, so that I only get the white pixels out of here. Uh, and not really caring about hue because you know it could be any of the any of the colors of, of you know the rainbow. Uh, once I had gotten these pixels thresholded, so I basically have the white ones, a human, it's really easy to identify right now. Oh yeah, obviously the arrows here, you know, these are the texts there, uh, but a little bit harder for a machine. Uh, next I eliminated all the boundaries. Basically I cropped out all the stuff that I don't care about. So eliminated everything to the left here, everything above here, and everything below here. I had to be really careful about the below part. And actually the first part of this script, uh, sort of messed up and the, um, first route actually puts the text pretty low. Uh, and this is actually a previous route here, so we don't actually want to care about the water here. So it's important to crop this correctly here. Um, once I had cropped this, uh, I used a technique called, uh, I think it's erosion and dilation or something like that. Uh, basically, it takes any sort of grouping of pixels and turns them more into blobs. Uh, so you can see here, I've, I've sort of blobified all of the things here. Uh, it eliminates all the little holes inside this, as well as uh, kind of turns the text into a rectangle. 
Uh, once I have these rough rectangle shapes, I can then use contours, uh, basically identifying the shapes inside this and figure out their bounding boxes. Uh, from the shapes, I can tell, you know, this is a small square, this is a rectangle, this has a sort of larger square bounding box, etc. Uh, I can eliminate all the small squares. I don't care about those. I know the big square is going to be my arrow, and I know the remaining rectangles are going to be the types. And then from that, you know, I can get these, these rectangles that I showed in the first picture. And then I can pass these rectangles into an OCR engine and, you know, figure out uh, what the text is. I think this is actually probably the, the, the most intelligent part of this whole script and it probably took the most uh, thinking in order to get this working, but I wanted to show that. Uh, another problem that I had with this, and we'll actually, uh, I'll forward ahead in this script a little bit to where uh, we're actually battling something. It went too far here. Uh, so you'll notice that there's a move arrow and there's a bunch of different moves that it can choose. Um, I wrote a little AI to pick the best move. Uh, it's it's not very good at doing so, but uh, in order to identify the best move, it needs to know where this arrow is pointing so it clicks on the right move. Uh, and I had a really hard time identifying this arrow because uh, if you see, if we'll be able to see it really quickly here, but the arrow actually bounces back and forth. And so there's no definite pixel where this is. Now there is a black outline here, but I found that the black outline actually isn't always black. It's some other random color. Yeah, you can see the arrow bouncing there. Um, but I need to basically figure out where this arrow is. And so I learned another technique in order to do that, uh, which is, I believe it's called template matching. Uh, basically, I took a, a screenshot of that and, yeah, and identified the arrow, the move arrow, and blanked out the background. I don't really care about matching that on the image. And then what the template matching method does is it basically creates a map over the entire space here of uh, values from 0 to 255. Basically, 255 is where the template matches exactly, and everything else is kind of the distance between uh, the pixels matching. And so then I can say, oh, well, there's a 255 pixel here. Of these positions, it's in the second one. So that's kind of the two cool things that I learned while doing this. Uh, and now I want to walk you through the script and kind of how it executes, as well as, uh, you know, where I had a bunch of, you know, thinking bits that had to go on. Um, so the first thing that I'm showing here is these are the Pokemon I have configured. Uh, I sort of fudged this for the video so that it made an interesting set of uh, things to walk through. But um, in particular, it's going to try and get grass types. And that's that's one of the things it's going to try and do here. Uh, all right, so this is the first thing that's interesting about um, Dynamax Adventures. I'm playing in offline mode, so I'm not playing with any other people. But the game is really only programmed for doing Dynamax Adventures with other people. And so if you turn the game off and turn it back on again, which I use to preserve the Pokemon that it's trying to go for, uh, then it charges you a little bit of attacks at the beginning of Dynamax Adventures. And this tax increases over time. So you can see here it charged me uh, three ore. I have 234, so that, that's essentially zero at this point. But the next time it'll charge me four, five, six, seven, etc. And if you run out of ore, you just can't do it. So you have to go find ore somewhere else in the overworld. Uh, and so my script is very careful to not <laughs> consume too much ore. Otherwise, it won't be able to, to do this properly. Um, all right, cool. So now that we've paid our tax, we can start by getting a Pokemon. Skip ahead a little bit here. Um, and this is kind of the first thing where my script makes a decision. Oh, we actually missed the decision part here. Uh, so I could probably program what the best Pokemon are in Dynamax Adventures, uh, but I got lazy. And the nice thing about Dynamax Adventures is you don't have to build a very good AI to win at it because you have three partners that are decent-ish. And as long as you're not you know, attacking your partners, you're probably gonna win most of the time. But I wanted to pick good Pokemon. And so what I did for this is I first identified the names of the Pokemon. There's a few Pokemon that are just terrible garbage. So I want to avoid those ones entirely. None of these ones are uh, terrible garbage. But then I look at the stats of the Pokemon. So I look at the attack and the special attack. I ignore everything else. I'm just looking at the attack stats. I'm basically trying to do hyper offense, basically only attack since I'm picking the strongest one here. Uh, in this case, 181, this special attack stat here is going to be way better than anything else. And so you'll see here that it picks uh, Duraludon instead of uh, everything else. Duraludon being big building Pokemon. Uh, and then Dynamax Adventure should start here. 
Uh, you'll see at the bottom that we have rock and water type. Uh, I don't actually care about either of those. Oh, wait, maybe I did program in rock for this. We'll see. Yeah, okay, rock has a score of one. Basically, it cycles through all the possible paths here, figures out what their type is, and scores them against the number of Pokemon that I might try and get in those paths. Uh, we saw the Pokemon list earlier. I guess I can just open up here again. Uh, oh, yeah, we did have one rock Pokemon in here, right on. Um, so it picked rock here. Now, this isn't one of the Pokemon that I want. Neither is this one. This is actually a rock type too, uh, but <laughs> the script doesn't know that. A human can pick this out pretty easily, but figuring out silhouettes here would have been so hard. Uh, okay, so we start our Dynamax here. Uh, the first thing that it needs to do is identify what this Pokemon is. It could use this text up here. However, this was one of the first mistakes I made in the code as well. This white text up here often has the Pokemon behind it. And if the Pokemon is white, the text is really hard to figure out. So what it does instead is it opens up this menu and figures out what the Pokemon name is. It also tries to figure out what the types are here. And this is important because, uh, at least for me, it was important because I was trying to get Alolan Raichu. Uh, which is a electric psychic type. Normal Raichu is also in this, and my script, the earlier version, spent a lot of time wasted trying to get the wrong Pokemon shiny. Uh, so the script here tries to identify those. Um, and so you can see here, uh, oh, this is the move part. So it tries to figure out what move is good based on the effectiveness text, how much PP is left, and the power. Uh, and it's not very good at that. You'll see here that it picks the wrong move because, uh, you know, it <laughs> has some trouble parsing the PP. It has some trouble parsing the effectiveness. This here is supposed to say effective, but it has square bracket nonsense. Um, but it cycles through the moves, tries to pick the best one. It's a little bit slow. Like a, a human's going to be much better at picking the right move immediately. But this was good enough and something that I could just run in the background without really worrying about what it's doing. Uh, but anyway, forward through here a little bit. Uh, once it has defeated the Pokemon, which should happen right here, um, it knows whether what type this Pokemon was or what, what you know species it is and decides not to catch it. If it were a Pokemon that it wanted to catch, it would obviously catch it. Um, we'll show one more pathway and then I'll show you sort of what it does at the end because uh, this is a little bit redundant here. Yeah, okay, so you can see here that it picked a score of two for grass. So we had two grass Pokemon. Uh, and we battled this Gloom. And this was one of the ones that it wanted to catch. So we should see here that it'll try and catch the Pokemon. Uh, or not. Oh, wait, no, it wasn't Gloom that it was trying to catch. It's Blossom that it wanted to catch. Okay, we'll skip ahead a little bit more. Uh, and the catches in this are guaranteed, which is kind of nice. So you can use whatever Pokeball you want. And... Um, and it'll always succeed at catching the Pokemon. Yeah, these take a long time. <laughs> We're skipping a lot of the, the video here. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, so it catches the Pokemon, um, but I don't know whether it's shiny yet. It generates its shininess at the end of Dynamax Adventure, so even though this is a non-shiny Bell Awesome here, it might be shiny when we finish the adventure and check the Pokemon. Um, so it catches the Pokemon, uh, there's some logic to check whether it should switch Pokemon if this had a better attack stat, but skip ahead to the end where we finally, uh, we see that we got Blossom here. It's going to check the summary and, oh, that's a little glitchy. And if it's shiny, there will be a little star here. I actually have an example of that. This here. Shiny, yeah, so you can see it'll have a little star here. And what my code does is it grabs this little rectangle here and then tries to find red pixels in here. And if there's like 240-ish pixels, then it knows that it's shiny. If there's zero, it knows that it's not shiny. Um, and so in this case, there's no shininess. Uh, it actually cycles through this a few times because uh, it could have caught up to three Pokemon. And since it found a Pokemon that we wanted, it's gonna soft reset the game and start over again. Uh, but basically, that's how this script works. Um, I learned, I think, a bunch of cool stuff, and I hope you found this interesting. Um, thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.